Hello and, and welcome to Addressing Trauma in Educational Settings. Today's agenda will walk you through uh, a quick welcome and some information about the Regional Educational Lab. And then it will also uh, focus on three main areas. First is preparing to build your trauma-sensitive school um, integrating key elements of trauma-sensitive approaches and aligning and sustaining trauma-sensitive approaches. So I would like to welcome you. My name is LaDotta Taylor and I am with Elevation, a woman-owned small business in West Virginia. And I also work with the Adventure Group, a nonprofit serving educational um, clients. It's a pleasure to be here today as a partner with SRI International as part of this Regional Education Laboratory webinar. The Regional Education Laboratories are, um, organiz are, are organizations that um, are funded by the Institute of Education Sciences within the U.S. Department of Education. There are 10 laboratories uh, across the state across the nation. And you can see on the screen that REL Appalachia Regional Education Lab for Appalachia is in the green color. And uh, that is the organization that is bringing you this webinar today. The, um, the RELs uh, work in partnership with stakeholders to conduct applied research and trainings with the mission of supporting a more evidence reliant education system. And through the REL program, we carry out three main activities. First, we conduct a wide variety of applied research studies. Second, we provide educators and other stakeholders with training, coaching, and technical support in using research findings and evidence in the classroom to improve teaching and learning. And lastly, disseminate findings from research in ways that educators and policymakers can use in can use in practice. In short, the REL program offers support to state education agencies, local education agencies, and schools that helps practitioners use evidence-based practices. This isn't a one-size-fits-all approach. We at REL AP are working with our states and districts on quite a diverse set of projects. So specifically in REL Appalachia, um, we serve Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia. And again, the effort is led by SRI International with support from various partners. As mentioned, we rely on research and evidence to help educators and practitioners use this in practice. To do this, the REL team supports stakeholders in various ways to help stakeholders understand that evidence base of certain practices on how to collect data or monitor practices and help you understand if practices are working or not. As a former classroom teacher, I can tell you that the resources and the information that is provided through REL Appalachia are very helpful resources to educators. And they are things that as educators, teachers in the classroom, we don't have time to um, search for, but this information is very, very helpful to applying the research in the classroom to provide better instruction. The REL also provides services through three main areas. Um, you know, in addition to that ongoing work that we have, we offer several resources and services that support quick turnaround requests for data and evidence. Ask a REL is a collaborative reference desk service provided by the 10 regional education laboratories and functions much in the same way as a technical reference library. If you have a research-based education question, we provide references, referrals, and brief responses. We can also support understanding and assessing the levels of evidence outlined in the Every Student Succeeds Act. We also provide resources, tools, and reports on a wide variety of topics like behavioral and mental health, data use, and research tools. The work from the REL is disseminated through a variety of channels, including our websites and REL blog posts, Twitter, YouTube, and newsletters. For example, 
the REL YouTube channel offers short videos that demonstrate ways that educators are using evidence in practice. So to begin to dive into our topic today, this webinar is part of a three-part professional development series. REL Appalachia and the West Virginia Department of Education co-developed this PD series. The first module uh, dealt with the impact and symptoms of trauma um, strategies. The second is classroom and school practices to support evidence, um, ex to support students experiencing trauma. And then today's is focused on school systems, policies, and um, procedures. So today's you really helps tie up everything that we've talked about. It brings a different perspective. Um, this recording and the materials for this module are available through the REL Appalachia website and also on the West Virginia um, Learning Management System through the West Virginia Department of Education. The objectives for <clears throat> this webinar um, is really about building knowledge and about implementing trauma-sensitive school policies, procedures, and systems. So you can see that we will work, talk with you and increase understanding about developing that shared vision and common understanding about trauma-sensitive work, integrating and aligning key elements of trauma-sensitive schools and monitoring and sustaining progress and impact. As far as the trauma-sensitive schools, the objectives are looking at all aspects of the educational environment and, and make sure that they are ground that they provide a grounding in an understanding of trauma and its impacts and addressing trauma's impact school-wide and promoting resilience for all, all is at the center of the educational mission. So the context for this PD series is really on supporting students experiencing trauma. And just some, some bullets for you to consider as we begin this conversation um, around student trauma in West Virginia schools. Traumatic stress induced by family and community opioid use negatively impacts students' well-being and outcomes. School staff in West Virginia communities affected by both substance abuse and COVID-19 need support to help students. Given the prevalence of these problems that touch all students and families, universal support for all students is needed. Schools play a critical role in supporting students experiencing trauma. So would ask you to pause and reflect on the poll questions that we included in our live webinar. First is to what extent is it a priority at your school to create a trauma, trauma sensitive environment? Is that a high priority, medium or low? And again, would ask you to pause and reflect on that question. Next, what do you find challenging about creating a trauma-sensitive school environment? Choose all that apply. Developing a shared vision and common understanding about trauma-sensitive work, integrating and aligning key elements of trauma-sensitive schools, monitoring and sustaining progress and impact. So please pause and reflect on that question. At this time, I would like to introduce our facilitators, uh, Mariana Lenz from Marshall University, Conra Lucas Adkins from Marshall University, and today, Michelle Woodbridge from SRI International. It is my pleasure to now turn the, the slides over to Michelle. Thank you. Thanks so much, LaDotta, and hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Woodbridge, and I'm a researcher and TA provider from SRI International. And my job today is to help set the stage for our work together. I am so honored to be here alongside my fellow presenters and with you all. And I really appreciate your taking valuable time out of your day to watch this webinar. I know how hard it is to do that with all of your competing demands, but I think you'll find this is a great investment of your time. So let's get the show on the road. So what makes a school trauma sensitive? Um, back in our first mod module that we presented back in November, we discussed the major elements and core domains of trauma-sensitive schools. So we wanted to quickly review those with you now. These three domains include one, staff preparation and professional development. The ultimate goal is that all of your staff have a shared understanding about the impacts of trauma. 
and why a school-wide approach is really needed. Secondly, trauma-sensitive schools have trauma-sensitive policies and procedures, such as disciplinary practices that support students' sense of safety and security, and effective communication that is shared among home, school, and community agencies to address trauma. And finally, evidence-based tiered supports that involve screening so you can identify who really has needs and then appropriately address them with universal secondary and tertiary interventions. So the roadmap for building trauma-sensitive schools starts with you as school leaders, specialists, counselors, and district administrators who have great influence on school culture and are very important change agents. An effective leader can clearly articulate the purpose of building a trauma-sensitive school, mobilize needed resources, address concerns and questions, and connect people and programs as needed to really set the tone and build the success of this change process. So this quote really illustrates this critical role. It comes from our friends at the Massachusetts Advocates for Children. And give you a second to read it yourself and then follow on your heels by reading it out loud. We have seen groups work with great energy without involvement from their leadership and achieve short-term goals. However, sustainability and the capacity to shift the school's ecology require that the principal or headmaster make trauma sensitivity one of the school's priorities and participate as a key member of the coalition. The principal is needed to make sure all the actions related to trauma sensitivity are woven throughout the school and aligned with other ongoing initiatives, such as bullying prevention, dropout prevention, positive behavioral health, social emotional learning, and others. Adopting a trauma sensitive approach requires focused, ongoing, and committed work, and it can take a whole school year or even more but we are going to help break it down for you into doable steps today. We have borrowed a framework for today's presentation from an action guide and training program called Leading Trauma Sensitive Schools. It's from the National Center on Safe and Supportive Learning Environments. And the guide outlines four phases that we'll go through today in succession. The first phase, the one I get to present is prepare to adopt a trauma sensitive approach. So how do we best prepare? We start by considering four main questions. What is our intention? By this, we mean, how can we develop a shared understanding, a shared vision across our staff, our families, and our students? What are the most important things we need to do? What changes or improvements do we need to make to reach our goals to be trauma sensitive? Secondly, are we all on the same page? What kinds of trainings and resources are needed so that all of our staff, meaning general and special education faculty, support staff, counselors, clerical and custodial staff, our SROs, cafeteria workers, bus drivers, librarians, and others, that we all have a shared vision and understanding about how to build a trauma-sensitive school. Third, do we have the infrastructure, the people, and the places to support the change process? For example, who can help you do this important work? And do they have the resources and support they need to do it? You may need to recruit and invest in a multidisciplinary work group. We'll talk a lot about that today. And provide those folks with a place and protected time to do the planning that they need to do. The team could include school staff with different roles, students, even family members, and probably even a few folks external to your school from community agencies. Finally, are you ready to do this? Is your staff ready? And how will you really know if they are ready? Meaning, are you all motivated to adopt a trauma-sensitive approach to potentially change the way you do things? And do you have the capacity and the will to invest in, in this over the long term? So we encourage you now to pause and do some self-reflection. As you think about your school context, which question is the most worrisome to you? Consider how a trauma-sensitive 
approach might align with or might even challenge you or your colleagues. So now we'll go a little deeper into how to address those major questions to best prepare. We start with developing a shared vision. Here are some ways school leaders can help their community all be on the same page about building a trauma-sensitive school. First, nurture your own network of friends and fellow leaders who are committed to doing this kind of work. They can provide you with moral support, lessons learned, solutions to common problems, and when those problems aren't so easy to solve, some brainstorming opportunities to solve them together. Try to gather what approaches look like in different schools and hear about potential challenges and solutions. Get ideas about successful strategies and hear testimonials from those that are right in the midst of the process to build connections for you and your staff to help you on your own journey. Communicate your commitment to this initiative to staff, to students, to parents, wherever and whenever you can. Make sure this topic is always part of your get togethers and meetings and show support by providing staff with time and space to do this too, to engage and learn together. Welcome families and students to this planning process as you can too. Third, offer your staff time for professional development and for sharing the information they learn and the questions and the concerns they have with one another. Use staff or team meetings for people to communicate what they hope your trauma-sensitive schools might look like in the future. And remember that the materials for modules one to three of our series will be available on the REL AP website for your own use. You can also get the Leading Trauma-Sensitive Schools Guide online, and it has accompanying training packages with online modules that you can share with your school staff. Some of the topics address how to understand trauma and its impact, and how to build trauma-sensitive schools. Finally, educate yourself. Seek out training and resources, online forums, conferences, activities to increase your own knowledge, and then follow up with your staff about what you learned. There are ample opportunities out there as the synergy and the understanding of this important topic, topic grows around the country. After developing a shared vision, we need to establish structures or make efficient use of those that already exist in our school. As you know, there's a lot of talent, skills, resources, and willingness that already exist in your school to launch this work and help it thrive. So leverage what you have and make sure your staff have built into their day time to engage in this work. Ask yourself honestly, is there time? Is there coverage? Is there space in our schedules for professional development? And if not, commit to making it happen. Think about what other initiatives are already in place that, you can, that can incorporate a trauma lens. For example, do you currently have a PBIS, MTSS, or RTI initiative and team that can serve as a foundation for this work? Can you all share resources and reduce the duplication of those efforts? Think about forming a trauma-sensitive work group specifically and make sure it includes all voices in the community. That means staff, students, families, and some community partners. As I mentioned before, if your school already has work groups focusing on school-wide issues, think about ways to align these efforts and leverage existing work. But ask yourself again, honestly, how can I ensure that all representative voices feel welcome to contribute to the work? You might set a more welcoming tone by thinking about rotating the memberships of these groups to avoid burnout, but also allow fresh and diverse perspectives to join the team and communicate an open, authentic, and respectful invitation for involvement so that people have multiple and various ways to get involved at different levels and to be heard. You could take the temperature of those groups and of a wider group of stakeholders frequently um, through surveys and focus groups or even just regular check-ins. So again, I encourage you to pause now and think about these questions, maybe even jot down a few ideas. What kind of relevant work groups exist at your school now? And who serves in these work groups? So after suitable structures are in place, we have a shared vision. We have to think about assessing our readiness for change because timing is everything. 
So making sure that your school community is ready for this investment is critical. You can assess and promote readiness in many ways. We know that each school is unique and has its own culture and demands, priorities and voices that affect preparation and readiness for change. Can you build on common shared values and experiences or do you need to make some adjustments? For example, examine how your staff communicate with each other and with families. Are these communication channels open and transparent? Are they respectful? Communication is key to sharing a vision and enacting true change. So think about that. Also, what about staff morale and support? Are your colleagues there for each other in a supportive way? Or can you promote more positive and productive relationships? Are there natural leaders standing up to champion this process? And who listens to whom? You can actually measure your school community's readiness their attitudes and motivation to adopt this approach and their capacity to make things happen. And this slide lists a couple of example measures that are available to you that you might consider that can quantify that readiness. The ARCTIC or Attitudes Related to Trauma-Informed Care Scale is a really psychometrically strong instrument that measures the attitudes of your staff toward trauma-sensitive approaches. And the leading trauma-sensitive schools guide that we're relying on today for this framework includes a staff survey that asks about the degree to which this is a priority to your staff and they are receptive to change and have champions to lead that change. So there's a couple of really great sources there for, for where you can start to assess your readiness. But now some more time for self-reflection. And this might be a particularly challenging one to think about. How can you hold all staff, including yourself, accountable for readiness for trauma-sensitive work? How can you assess and promote that readiness in a feasible way? We know that buy-in to this change process is critical. Increasing the number, the knowledge, and the passion of people surrounding you who are committed to doing this work and will champion it alongside you will build and sustain the initiative. And as I've tried to emphasize in this section, developing a shared vision can start with education. This free 11 minute video we would like to show you a portion of could be a really good place to start to set the stage and frame your work together. In my work in local schools, after viewing this video, it did a lot to help folks to be on the same page about the importance of the work, have an understanding about the impact of trauma on students and staff, and share a will and a vision to make their school trauma sensitive. So we're gonna play a clip right now for you. when you're 14 and 15, everything is a new experience. They haven't developed all the coping skills. And when they're new experiences, they tend to be more intense. And so it impacts them far more. And sometimes they choose inappropriate ways to resolve those feelings. We think kids are behavior problems or um, they're not interested in learning or they're not able to learn. When really, when you get down to the bottom of it, there's some experience that they've had that has taken priority over, you know, everything that's going on in their life. Those experiences and those reactions that we have to seeing really scary things can impact everything from attendance to school behavior to test scores. Attendance is never just about attendance and bad grades is never just about a lazy kid. A lot of times what we perceive as learning disabilities or lack of skills, it has to do with what went on the night before, what's going on in their lives. They're not able to study, they're not able to attend in their class, and then after a point, they kind of give up. During study time, like when it's quiet, I'll start to think about things, and things will start to get to me. They're on survival mode. Quite frankly, learning the periodic table is not the primary thing they learn. It's hard to concentrate on your work, you know, thinking about all those things. The school nurses wear a, a white coat that says on it, healthy kids learn better. That doesn't just go for physical health. If they're not healthy, um, both emotionally and physically, then they really can't attend to what they need to attend to. 
Uh, I was in an honor roll student. No, I'm not. I had like a 3.5. That was my GPA, and I was like a 2.9. Nothing is as distracting as intrusive thoughts, sadness, anxiety, or pain. The effect of trauma on school performance is well documented. There are many studies that have shown that exposure to violence affects school attendance, it affects graduation rates, they're much reduced, it affects grades, grades are much lower of children who've been exposed to violence, and maybe we just haven't done a very good job of communicating that. I had a couple teachers that did not get the point at all. I don't really talk to them because they don't know where I'm coming from. Like, nobody understands my pain. They knew what happened, but they never took it into consideration at all. There's so much stress that I have and like so many hardships that I need someone to talk to. I believe that schools are a good place to start, let's say, the healing process with a lot of these incidents that happen. Kids spend a lot of time in school. They're here all day long. We're like their second home. And so we have to nurture them and guide them and uh, deal with what's going on. We recommend that teachers, you know, certainly are observing their students. And if they notice a change in behavior, change in their work habits, a lot of times behind that is some very severe trauma. And so we just ask teachers to be sensitive to the particular student and um, just give them space but also indicate that they are available if the student wants to talk to them about something. Sometimes I talk to some of my teachers because I have my favorites that I feel comfortable talking to. These are the teachers our students talk about and say, you know, that's a teacher I always will remember because they were there for me when I needed Every kid needs to have, you know, a couple of different options in their experience on the campus so that there's at least some place for them to go. And sometimes it needs more than a teacher. It needs people with more and better training or people with access to more and better resources. You could coordinate the response from not just law enforcement, but also mental health professionals, teachers, administrators, and, and, and people within the community to start addressing some of these issues. Programs like that, I mean, it teaches them how to talk, how to say what they feel. As a parent, we should have more of this help. Once caregivers, um, teachers, and administrators understand normal responses to trauma, the experience of working and providing support to a student is a lot easier. Now, the good news is that with early intervention, children really can resume their lives and do much better in school. In general, young people are open and interested and want to be heard and want to share. And we just need to lay the foundation. Thank you. I want to acknowledge that the developers of the CBITS program, the Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma in Schools program, at Trauma Aware Schools, which is part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, generously shared this video file with our team so that we could share it with you. But the video is freely available to you after registering for free on the cbitsprogram.org website. So you can also get access to lots of valuable resources there. Registration takes just a few seconds and you don't get any unsolicited emails from registering. So I encourage you to access this resource and to take another look at the video in full. We encourage you now to just take a pause, take a breath, and take a moment to think about what this video sparked in you. What, what kinds of emotions did it stir up? And, and how do you think your staff, students, and families might react to this video? It is my pleasure now to introduce my colleague, Mariana Linz. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I appreciate all that wonderful information. It'll be good foundation for us moving forward. 
I'm Mariana Lenz. I'm with the psychology department at Marshall University. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you talking about how we integrate key elements of trauma-sensitive approaches into our school settings. So as we go into phase two of our framework, we're really going to be spending some time thinking about how we envision our own schools as trauma-sensitive environments. We're providing you with a, a lot of information. Sometimes it may seem like a whole lot of information. And so we wanna give you the opportunity to think about your own bricks and mortar, your own staff and your own teachers um, and the people who are forming that wonderfully supportive environment that you're in. And think about how some of this information applies at that level. And so as we move into thinking about those sorts of things, um, we're going to be focusing on four very important questions. So we're going to be encouraging you to think about when you envision trauma sensitive schools, what is your current capacity school wide for trauma sensitivity. Um, these days we're all strapped for resources. And a lot of times we feel like there are things we ought to be doing, but, but we just don't have the staff and resources. So we wanted to give you time to think about what is your capacity? What are your needs? How can we creatively use what's available to create the most supportive environment that we can for our students? We also want to think about what plans we have and how to proceed, what things we need to put in place. Uh, are we all in agreement with the plan in the area of focus when you think about those that you work with on a daily basis, sort of as Michelle was referring to that idea of readiness? Um, where is everybody? Um, as we've noted with some groups, they've said, well, sometimes I'm on this page and they're two pages ahead and somebody else is a page behind. So how do we get to the same spot? And then finally, we want to think about how we're monitoring progress and impact. How do we know we're making a difference? Sometimes we're so busy doing the things that we need to do, we don't have the opportunity to see the progress that we're making and the important impacts that we're having on our students and their families. So this phase is going to involve really embedding those key elements of trauma sensitivity into the school environment. So we wanna be thinking about how can I, on a daily basis, in the place that I'm in, uh, with the people that I work with, support staff's professional development as well as their well-being? How are we assessing student needs and getting a realistic picture, picture and an accurate picture of both their needs as well as their strengths and resources? And how are we providing relevant supports to allow them to move forward? How are we creating that safe and supportive environment that really builds social and emotional skills. We know that children and families who have experienced trauma and chaos and challenges in their lives very often have difficulty laying that foundation to move forward with healthy social and emotional development. So we'll have the opportunity to think about what can we be doing at a number of levels to promote that. And then we'll also be thinking about the policies and procedures that are in place and how they align with the idea of a trauma sensitive environment. We know sometimes those policies fit like hand in glove. Sometimes it's because we crafted them that way. Sometimes we've inherited policies and procedures that are less friendly and, and line up less well with those objectives. So we'll have a chance to think about those things and consider how we can make the adjustments that we need to make. And then finally, once again, how are we monitoring the implementation of those new practices to create those safe and supportive environments? How are we looking at and understanding the outcomes and then sharing them with our faculty and our staff and our families in a way that allows us all to celebrate the wonderful work that we're doing? So that data doesn't be, become just about collecting the numbers for someone else, but they come about, they come about by allowing us to look at the important benefits that we're providing to our, to our children, to our students, to their families, and taking time to celebrate those accomplishments. And so I want us to pause and take a moment and kind of envision that school setting that we go into day in, day out, um, that place where we see all those wonderful people and wonderful students and families, and sometimes the ones that try us every now and again. Uh, but when you think about your own school, 
um, and visualize it as a trauma sensitive environment? What are the things that stand out to you, either the spaces that you have or the practices, either formal or informal, uh, that you have that really support a trauma responsive environment? So think about that for a minute. Even the little things like standing outside the door and saying hi to kids and I missed you. We weren't here yesterday. I'm glad you're here. Okay. So keep those things in mind as we move forward because those are the foundations that you're going to be building on as we think about um, some of these uh, some of these elements of a trauma sensitive environment. So once again, we're going to be considering how we support staff and professional development and well-being, how we assess our students so that we get an accurate picture of the assets that they have, as well as the challenges that they need to meet. Um, and how do we do that in a trauma-sensitive way so that trauma doesn't sort of um, form a barrier to us seeing the real child? How do we create safe and supportive environments that help us build those healthy social and emotional skills and collaborate and encourage those collaborative relationships um, among students, staff, families, and teachers? And then finally, how do we align? We're going to be aligning and reviewing school policies and procedures with trauma sensitive approaches. So, thinking about those policies and procedures that are in place and trying to figure out how we can make them better align with the idea of a safe and supportive environment. So let's consider first that very important piece of supporting staff professional development and well-being. We all know that our teachers and our staff are really the cornerstone of our environment, much more important than any brick uh, that's in the building or any space that we have. They are our most important asset. And so it's important to provide the kind of environment where there is ongoing training and support for awareness of the impacts that trauma has and how having a, to use uh, my colleague, Dr. Lucas Adkins phrase, how having a trauma lens uh, allows us to see a child more clearly, how to understand their behavior more accurately um, and how to help them grow in the most supportive and healthy way that we can. Um, and we know that staff are exposed to the material, but we also wanna be thinking about how they can make use of that material and how they're able to apply it to the children and families that they work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also have to keep in mind that as we're providing this um, sometimes very academic information about trauma and its impacts, it may also be triggering to some of our faculty and staff, either because of their own experiences and their own backgrounds or just the fact that they've been in the field and they've been supporting families and students for a very long time. And those can be very emotionally difficult situations that can create what we call secondary traumatic stress. That occurs when we've been exposed to the experiences of others, others that we care about in a very empathic way and that we've had to um, sort of help and support along the way. And so we want to think about how we're supporting our staff in those situations and how we're helping them to deal with the stress that may be present in their environment. Um, and so as we move forward, we wanna think about keeping their, the information up to date, but also recognizing that keeping that information up to date can sometimes be emotionally difficult. There are some wonderful resources through REL Appalachia that can help us be more aware and put supports in place um, for faculty as they're gaining those competencies and that information. And so let's talk about some sort of nuts and bolts and concrete things that we could be doing to support our teachers and staff uh, as they're supporting others, or as I like to say, how we can help them secure their own oxygen mask while they are uh, assisting others as well. Um, we always think about um, students and families and the multi-tiered system of support, but I think it's also important to consider how that same multi-tiered system of support can apply to our staff and our teachers in terms of providing for the, both their professional development as well as their emotional well-being. So when we think about those tier one supports, 
we want to be thinking about those things that we can do universally in the environment that everybody's going to benefit from. It's going to bring everybody's stress level down just a little bit, and it's going to give everybody that opportunity to feel just a little bit more positive uh, about things. And so give them that extra shot of dopamine, so to speak, that neurotransmitter that makes us feel really good. So what can we build into the environment that does those kinds of things? One of the things you hear all the time, that phrase, creating an attitude of gratitude or in an environment that truly celebrates people and shows that the work that they do are, is appreciated. You know, very often our day starts as soon as we, our feet hit the floor when we get out of bed. Um, and we start thinking about the kids and we're thinking about um, their families and we're thinking about our colleagues and what we're gonna do and we're planning and adjusting and we get to work and we have to make more adjustments. And then at the end of the day, we're exhausted and we feel good about what we did, but boy, it sure would have been nice if somebody said, thanks, I appreciate that. Um, and so very often we, we do recognize that person that's, that's adding things to that, to that plate that's doing the extras, that's doing the extra mile, but we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that teaching and supporting students and families is a big job. Um, it's a big job in terms of just the things that you're doing, but it's a big job in terms of the emotional investment that you make. And so taking the time to let, let teachers and staff know that they're appreciated through the little things. When families come by and a parent says, I really appreciated what so-and-so did, um, either encouraging them to stop by and say thank you or making sure that you let the, the, the teacher or the staff person know um, that they were appreciated, not because they wore themselves out and spent every piece of energy they had and then some, but because they're doing their job and because they care and that's a good thing. Think about op-ed pieces in the local media, whether that's the newspaper or maybe there's a community uh, electronic bulletin board um, that you could, you could post uh, information on about things that your teachers are doing just as, a, as their day-to-day -day job. I think about when COVID hit and all the teachers that flocked to the schools to pack up food and assignments and resources and materials and what an impact that had on letting parents know we support you. We may not get to see you every day in school, but we're here and we care. Um, that should be noticed in the local paper. It was here. Um, so letting them know that they're appreciated for the job that they do. Looking at the school for spaces that are just for teachers and other staff to relax and unwind that aren't full of educational materials, but have the soft, cushy spaces where you can, yeah, I'm going to show my age, do your crossword puzzles, or maybe do a craft or just talk with each other or complete that Amazon purchase, which we all know is a thing. Um, but a space where you can relax and unwind and connect with your colleagues uh, in a way that helps build that supportive environment. Where are those spaces and where's the opportunity? You might have staff that want to gather for 10 or 15 minutes before they go home and have a soda or a cup of coffee or just kind of uh, share the day to create those spaces and, and, and encourage those kinds of informal things. Community partnerships. Maybe you've got a restaurant that's willing to say, you know, today we've got the teacher special. So give us a call and for $5, we'll cook dinner for your family and we'll curbside deliver it. You just let us know you're coming and we'll meet you and hand it to you and off you go. Um, just to let you know, we appreciate what you do. Um, you know, appreciation nights uh, or shopping days that different businesses do. Letting the community express their gratitude for the impact that teachers have on that next generation. Um, making sure that your communication channels are open at all times. You really want to create that, that environment where people feel comfortable saying whatever they need to say uh, in whatever setting and that they don't have to add, oh, no, I didn't mean nothing by it. We just know sometimes you need to express and that happens. Maybe having weekly huddles uh, or quick Zoom check-ins um, so that people can share what are things that are going on, things that are in their, their uh, professional world um, that they either want to uh, let everybody know about because they're great or let everybody help share the burden because it's difficult, but making sure those opportunities for informal communication are there. Think about self-care training. We're always training teachers how to teach math better, 
how to do better with geography. Uh, consider in the next professional development meeting that you have, starting it with something fun, like let's all do yoga. And yeah, it's okay if you really can't do yoga and are kind of like me, I call myself the stiff and challenged, um, but giving you the opportunity to try those things or even you know something as simple as let's all make a facial mask that we're gonna put in a little jar or baggie and at the end of the day, we're gonna get to use it. Um, you know, something that really lets them know that their self-care and their well-being are important because self-care should not be about I've got to take a day off now because I'm exhausted. So that's my self-care. No, that's what you do to hold yourself together when you didn't engage in self-care. What we want to do is stress that self-care is a way of life. Uh, it is part of our educational culture and we value it just like we do keeping up with our math skills and our reading skills. We value self-care in every bit the same way. As we move up into that second tier, we know that we're focused on a slightly smaller group of our teachers and staff, ones who may be starting to experience some of the stresses and pressures that are part of teaching in everyday life. Um, so we want to be sure that we've created an open door, no judgment policy, that they can come forward with whatever and we will deal with it, we will roll with it. So I always say, look, at my age, you are not going to shock me, you're not going to tell me anything that I either A, haven't heard or B, um, can't appreciate, you know, no, I haven't heard the exact thing and I don't understand your exact circumstance until you share it, but it's okay for you to share whatever you need to share. Think about creating buddy systems um, where you've got those natural helpers in your environment that can um, be recognized by you, told how much they're appreciated and also be alerted when somebody needs that little extra support. Um, maybe you have people who are very good at particular procedures that really challenge and stress others out, um, you know, kind of help them find each other and support each other and then value what they're doing for each other. Think about virtual support groups, places where they can log in either in real time and share some thoughts or discussion boards or group chats. There's wonderful apps that you can use that teachers can kind of keep open and staff can keep open on an ongoing basis where they can just shoot each other, you know, oh, I need to vent and then load about this really quick or I'm having this trouble, you know, can anybody help me? I have a uh, colleague who's created, who's used an app, I'm not real app savvy, but she's created a, a, a system where they use an app where all of the providers can be in touch with each other constantly because they're in a rural area and really separated. So if they have a question or they can't figure out what to do, they put it in that app. It's very secure. Nobody else can get into it. And they said right away, I've got two or three people saying, oh, I've had that same situation. And they said, even though I'm alone, I don't feel alone. So thinking about those kinds of things can really help those, those teachers and staff that are beginning to feel the pressures of the job, letting them know they're not alone. Finally, when we get to that third tier and someone is truly struggling and needs some extra support and some extra assistance at the professional level, it's wonderful if you have access to an employee assistance program. Those can be tailored to meet the scheduling needs and the insurance needs uh, of your staff. So I really encourage you to talk with um, uh, your boards and, and other entities about how those can be created if they can, because they are wonderful things and they're so easy to use. Um, if that isn't possible, you may have a community-based behavioral and mental health service available. Um, and you may be able to reach out to that center and say, we'd like to have a place that we uh, encourage our staff to go, um, you know, what kinds of services here, could we do that? And finding other resources, private practices and so forth in the community and gathering those, um, those resources together. Um, you can also make use of WV411, the website and help for WV, um, both of those sites. And you can also call those numbers. Um, will give you as much information as they can about specific resources and phone numbers in your area. Um, individual teachers and staff can also reach out to them themselves. Um, and there are also um, some uh, uh, support lines that are available statewide and you can access those through um, help for WV where staff and teachers can reach out at no charge and have someone right away provide support and encouragement. 
And while we're on that topic, we want to be sure that we're creating an environment that destigmatizes help seeking. Very often, people really struggle with coming forward and saying, I need to do some counseling, I need to do some therapy. Um, and so for me, uh, for, for, for uh, my environment, I always make it a point to share, you know, when I was in therapy or when I go to counseling, um, so people know, I see it as natural and helpful, just like when I go to the doctor to get my blood pressure checked. We want it to be that natural. But even as much as we try to destigmatize and create an environment that's non judgmental, a lot of staff and teachers will find it more comfortable to seek out the assistance on their own. So try to think about how a repository, electronic or otherwise, could be created so that they can access that without necessarily having to make contact with someone. But let them know that we all need to do these things sometimes. And it's most important for ourselves, most importantly, but also those that we serve, that we keep ourselves as emotionally healthy as we do physically healthy. And so moving forward, so as we're thinking about how we're supporting our teachers and different things that we can do to, to support their needs and their emotional well-being, we also want to think about how trauma impacts the needs of our students and how we can get the most accurate picture of where our students are academically, social and emotionally, how we can really get a true picture um, of where our students are in any one of those areas at any point in time. Trauma has this nasty habit of impacting everything. It colors everything because over time it impacts the way we think, how we interpret the environment, even how we react to the environment. Think about it. If I'm driving down the road and I have a near miss, somebody pulls out in front of me because it's always their fault. Um, they pull out in front of me or I missed something and, and my adrenaline shoots up. Well, I'm immediately in tune to all these things in my environment, or I'm driving and I didn't realize there was black ice, but now I know there is. Now everything that looks wet, I'm really cautious about. The same thing is happening with kids uh, who've experiencing, uh, and, and older students as well, who have experienced trauma and chaos in their background. It's coloring the way they see everything. And so if we're not careful, it can give us an inaccurate picture of what the student is really capable of. Um, that student that blows up every time it's time to read, we might figure, well, they struggle with reading. They may do fine with reading, but maybe one of the more difficult times for them is when they're trying to do homework and they've got a parent who maybe is struggling with some other issues and is doing some things that, that, that can be very unpleasant. So we want to make sure when we are conducting assessments that we're doing that in a trauma-sensitive manner. If we don't have to exert time pressure, that we don't because we want to get a picture of their skill set. If we don't have to exert pressure for the best you can give me, then we say, do your very best. I want to see what you can do with this. Um, and letting them know that whatever they produce, as long as it's their best effort, is fine. So creating those environments that are supportive, giving breaks. Um, very often, kids who have come from environments where there's been a lot of trauma and chaos have trouble with extended focus. They can do the skill, but we need to separate how much of this difficulty with math is I can't do math, how much of it is I have difficulty focusing for more than 15 or 20 minutes at a time. And whenever we can, build those breaks in in a way that gives us the optimum performance. Because then we have that true picture of this is what they're capable of when the situation's ideal. Okay, we all know that life is not ideal. So when there's other pressures, this is what it does to what they're able to show. So how do we reduce that gap? How do we reduce the impact of that trauma so they get closer to that really excellent level of performance that, that, that they seem to be capable of? Also in terms of creating an inclusive environment, we wanna make sure that the, the environment in our school is sensitive to cultural issues. Um, certain ways of dressing that students may have that, that might be a problem in certain testing situations, we want to accommodate that. Um, if there are religious expectations for older students that may involve things like fasting, um, you know, and this may not be the best day um, for assessment, we want to be sensitive to that. Because again, that creates that sort of one of those tier one supports where the environment is inclusive and supportive. And we begin to get um, better accurate, more accurate reads on, uh, on what our students are capable of. 
And so there are a number of resources that you can draw on. For example, West Virginia Support for Personalized Learning Framework is a statewide initiative that can suggest flexible resources that will provide those relevant academic, social, emotional, and or behavioral supports that can help enhance the learning for all your students, regardless of their experience, uh, regardless of their experiences and their backgrounds. Um, and it also includes those elements uh, of response to intervention and the multi-tiered system of support that's so very important in the classroom. Um, some other resources include um, resources from uh, the Center for Mental Health at UCLA, um, as well as the School Mental Health Quality Guide that can assist with resource mapping, knowing what's there, knowing what you need. And finally, another um, uh, another point or two about uh, assessing within a trauma-sensitive framework. We have to remember that every kid's um, sort of scope of progress is different. For some kids, um, being able to make a lot of progress in the development and automatization of math skills is a very reasonable progress goal that we celebrate. But we should celebrate every bit as much that student who at the beginning of the year could not sit down and do math for more than five minutes without exploding. If they by the end of the year, even though they're still struggling with math, but they can sit and stick with it and plug away for 20, 25, 30 minutes, that's huge. So we want to make sure that in addition to the numbers that we need to collect to know where students are, that we're also celebrating and recognizing and documenting their individualized progress. And making use of things like functional behavior assessment frameworks can be really helpful in seeing us in helping us see that individual um, sort of progression in skill. So moving on, let's now consider how are we creating that safe and supportive environment. So take for a minute and think about your school and the special things that happen there that let every single student know, um, both the stellar students and the ones who are sometimes stinkers, let every student know that they are heard. They are missed when they are not there. We see them when they are there. They are valued, appreciated, and included. Think about that for a moment. Okay. So as we think about that safe and supportive space, um, two words in those, those descriptors that always stand out to me are seen and appreciated. Um, so often the child that struggles, particularly if they're a bit quiet or the child that has fewer resources, spends a lot of their time socially being invisible, feeling like they don't have impact, that they're not noticed. And so that teacher that greets them, that touches them on the shoulder and says, you were out sick yesterday, I missed you, I'm so glad you're back. You can't measure the impact that that has on that child's well-being and sense of safety. So we have to remember that children who come from trauma, who come from chaos, um, have adapted to a world where nothing is certain. And so they very often enter our classroom a little bit cautious, a little bit wary, sometimes defensive, sometimes with a chip. As they get older, we see that chip grow. Um, so when they get to high school, sometimes what we see is we don't see that child who's a little timid and has experienced trauma. We see this angry, belligerent, defiant, oppositional teenager. But guess what? Surpri no surprise to you. Those are the same child. That scared child and that teenager with a chip on their shoulder are one and the same. And so when that child gets to us in high school and they're belligerent, it's because they've learned along the way. Maybe they're not always valued, appreciated, missed, and seen. Um, so we want to think about how we're encouraging emotion regulation skills to develop all along the way. We want to model it for them. When we come in and we're having a hard time and things are not going well, it's okay for us to say, you know what, I'm having a moment. Let's all just sit for a minute and take a deep breath and regroup because I need to think about chocolate so I can get in a better headspace and then come back and say, okay, now let's go at this again what a lesson we just taught them. We can get stressed and we can handle it and we can regroup and move forward. When we have a student that's finding our last good nerve and we say to them, okay, we're both getting a little bit charged up. Let's stop a minute and take a deep breath. Okay, now let's start again. Tell me what's been going on. I'm getting the sense something's wrong. 
we're modeling for them this idea of when I get irritated, stop a minute, back up, take the time, calm down. That it helps to create a safe environment um, where they know what to expect. We also want to make sure that as much as we can, we're creating routines um, that help support um, balanced behavior and good decision making. These kids a lot of times have a hard time having those opportunities. And even though as they get into middle school and high school, we want them to take more responsibility and manage multiple things more. We have to realize that sometimes we have kids who are still developing those skills and we want to be sure we're building those routines into the environment that support them as they're learning to make decisions. So that when they're learning, when they're making choices, they don't have infinite choices, but a manageable number so that we're supporting them as they move forward. Um, we wanna be sure that there's an involvement of all the players so that parents are aware and not in a negative way of, oh my gosh, I'm calling about your child again, but more, we're making some progress, but um, we, need to, we need to think about how we can make more. So create that environment that really supports children and students as they're developing those important social and emotional skills. As we're doing that, we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that there are some evidence-based social emotional learning programs out there. There are some wonderful resources through What Works Clearinghouse, through CASEL, um, and uh, there's some wonderful things that the Wallace Foundation has that provide some very specific suggestions for the classroom environment that teachers can read about, look at, tailor to meet the needs of the students in their classroom, and really begin to build both, again, that tier one level of support so everybody's getting it, but also some ideas about how to target uh, some supports that might be useful for individual children experiencing some of their own unique struggles uh, in the environment. And so now let's turn our attention um, to the question of how do our policies align with the idea of a trauma-sensitive approach? I've yet to meet a teacher or an administrator that didn't get frustrated by policies and procedures that had outlived their usefulness um, very seldom do we get rid of rules. We just sort of stack rules on top of each other and create, as I like to call it, a camel. Um, so that at the end, we've got all of these things, but nobody remembers why we have them. We just do them. Um, so think about your school's mission and, and, po and policies. How do they fit with trauma responsive um, principles? Consider convening work groups or providing some way for teachers and staff but also students, particularly middle school and high school students, to provide feedback uh, about how those policies are working. So even though a child may be engaging in some oppositional and downright defiant and belligerent behavior and sometimes very aggressive behavior, that doesn't mean we shouldn't take a moment to say, tell me how you're feeling, tell me well, what's going on. Okay, you had to experience this, what was that like for you? What could we be doing that would be more helpful? Doing those kinds of things can help us get a different view of how policies might be coming across. We wanna really promote those policies that support positive behavior. So rather than waiting for something to happen that we're gonna punish, we want to take that opportunity to make sure that we're letting students know what's a preferable behavior, redirecting their behavior. When they're getting angry, how we need them, we tell them what to do. And rather than saying, stop yelling, saying, let's take a minute and breathe and talk calmly because now I'm telling you what to do. And sometimes when we hear all of this, we think, you know, in the real world, nobody's going to do that for them. And that may be true when they're grownups and they're out in their own jobs with their own families. But right now, while they're in school, the more of this we do for them, the less the real world has to accommodate to them. And so it's important to provide the supports now. And we want to model that respectful communication that we want them to have with us. Um, sometimes either out of frustration or maybe we think we're just kind of being funny and sarcastic. We might talk in a particular way. We need to know when we need to model that really respectful type of communication. So think for a minute of your own struggles. What are those policies um, that have perhaps been so rigid? Maybe it was a zero tolerance policy that was so rigid that you felt like you did a disservice to a student and their family in imposing it.
Okay. So moving on, we need to monitor progress and impact. And when we do that, we need to involve everybody, not just for the purpose of collecting better data. Uh, numbers are always good, but that's not the end game. Remember, the purpose of monitoring progress is to be able to see what we're doing, to see the disparities. Who are we helping? Who are we missing? When we aggregate, sometimes we can say, wow, look at the reading scores. They went way up. But there's still this one little group that never seems to progress. And if we only look at the big number, we miss the little piece. So we want to think about how can we set up work groups or recycle groups we've already had already put together, which is always good um, to help develop ways of monitoring and evaluating implementations of new policies um, that really help us see where we're having impact and where we're not. Um, make sure if there are work groups in place that who's or who are already tasked with some type of data collection that maybe perhaps they can add this as a nuance so we can see what data could be leveraged that we already have. For example, absentee data or discipline, disciplinary data can be very useful because as we implement policies and absences decrease, we can't say for sure it was the policy, but we know the policy is not pushing them away. Um, and so thinking about how we can leverage and use data that's already being collected, um, and then how we're perhaps most importantly, how we're disseminating that and getting it out there so that staff and um, faculty, our teachers, and also our families are seeing the progress that's being made. Sometimes a policy will get dropped from, from the great beyond into place and we're just told just do it but we never know why, and we never know whether it worked or what the impact was. We just do it. We collect numbers, we give them to somebody, and we never hear anything else about it. We don't know why, but anybody collects them. So if we're taking those nerve or those, those numbers, or we're giving pre and post surveys, we're asking parents, what do you think? And we're asking teachers, how is this working? And then we look at those numbers and we say, this is what we're gonna do. And then we say, okay, this is where we are and this is where we are now, then we get better buy-in and better support for the changes that we wanna make because they can see and celebrate the changes that are happening. Uh, I saw one documentary where a counselor was literally showing kids data. Okay, this is, this is what your grades look like when you're here. This is what they look like when you're not here. I don't know that it's causal, but clearly we'd rather you be here. Um, and you could just sort of see kids go, wow, I never thought of that. Um, so, so thinking about how we're collecting data in a way that allows us to see progress and that we're communicating it, we're letting other people in on that really good news um, is very important. So we have overwhelmed you perhaps with, with information. Hopefully not, hopefully we're getting you excited. So before we move into our next section of material with, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Conra Lucas Adkins, we're gonna take a moment and just center uh, and relax. Feel free to do whatever relaxes you. And if that happens to be Facebook or Amazon, no judgment here. But for the rest of us, let's just take a moment and we're gonna do some deep breathing and I'll guide you through that and some visualization and relaxation. So find a comfortable space. If closing your eyes is helpful, do that. But as you sit in this very comfortable space, I want you to try to get a picture or an image in your mind of something that brings you a warm and gentle joy. It could be a place, a person, it could be music, art, it could be as simple as a color but I want you to get it in your mind in detail so that you can see it and feel it, maybe even smell it, perhaps even taste it. And as you do that, place your hands lightly on your belly and breathe in. And as you breathe in, you feel your hands rise and then breathe out and feel your belly come down and your hands with them. And as you do that, take a moment to feel good about what you've decided to do with your time, the impacts that you've made 
on students and families. Thinking about the lives that you've touched. And as we say, if one life has breathed easier because what you have done, that is a success. And another deep breath in. Thinking about that beautiful image that we have in our mind, that warm and gentle joy, and we breathe out. And as we do, we let go of all those negative things, all those naggy little voices that tell us we're not doing enough. And we let them go because we know that we are doing so much more than enough. And we take one more deep breath in. And as we breathe out, we remember that what we've chosen to do is both joyful and hard. But we're choosing now to focus on the joy and to take a moment to savor the good things that we've been able to be part of and to think about the good things to come. Take what time you need to relax and regroup. And as you're ready, we'll move on to our next section. And now we'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Conra Lucas Atkins. Thank you so much, um, Mariana. That was a wonderful, relaxing time. <laughs> um, thanks to both you and Michelle for um, setting the stage for us and providing this, us this wonderful content. Um, and thanks to everyone for taking this opportunity to um, join this webinar, listening and, and watching as we present some information to you. Um, so my name is Conra Lucas Adkins and I am with the Department of School Psychology at Marshall. All right, so just bringing us back to the Leading Trauma-Sensitive Schools Action Guide that we have used to frame our presentation today. Um, Michelle started us out with phase one, Mariana um, guided us through phase two, and so I'm going to wrap things up with phases three and four, um, beginning with phase three. So aligning trauma sensitivity with other approaches. Um, both Mariana and Michelle talked about um, the importance of recognizing what you have in your school, recognizing those teams um, that are already in place in your school, and pulling resources together and making them um, aligned. Um, so administrators may use these three questions to guide them in their thinking and, and planning for um, aligning these approaches. First of all, asking um, the question, you know, how does trauma sensitivity align with approaches that we have universally um, at our school? Um, thinking about how uh, professional development opportunities could be aligned across approaches. Um, one example would be if you are having um, some professional development um, modules or webinars or trainings for your um, school PBIS team, that might be something that you want to extend to other members of your staff. Um, and then how can we embed trauma sensitive practices into existing structures and processes? Um, again, just echoing what Michelle and Mariana um, had talked about, thinking about the work groups that you have, those teams you already have, um, the assessments, how you um, are determining if kids are making progress um, or not. So how can you um, embed those trauma sensitive practices into those um, existing um, groups and, and practices? Um, and through the course of this um, presentation, um, hopefully you will be getting some answers to those questions that um, I had presented to you earlier and thinking about how you might um, move forward with those questions in your own schools, how you might um, plan some activities with your staff and faculty um, to get those questions answered. Um, you know, it's really important for us to not think about trauma sensitive supports as just something else. Here's one more thing that we have to add to our school's plan. Um, it's so easy for us to get into that mindset of, oh, 
you know, here's something else I have to do. Um, so as opposed to uh, staying with that thought, um, let's try to move to something like, well, here's what we have. And here's what we can do to make it more trauma sensitive, to make it better. Um, so investigating what is already happening is um, a great first step. Um, you know, in doing that, you may want to consider um, an activity that involves all your faculty, all your staff, um, and just starting out with generating a list of supports that you have um, for your students. Um, what are some things that are already existing in your schools that you do to support behavior and social emotional development? Administrators, school leaders can be in charge of this activity. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through um, an example of, of how you might want to organize that um, activity. Um, one thing you may want to keep in mind is that um, the pyramid, uh, the triangle that um, Mariana had shared with you earlier, um, and she was presenting supports for staff. So you might envision um, the pyramid and be thinking about supports for your students. Um, what do you have in place for tier one? You know, what do you have in place for tier two? And then what supports do you have for our most needy um, children at that tier three level? So once you make that list, um, you need to kind of reflect on how those efforts coordinate or how you can coordinate those efforts that are already in place. And then if you realize that you, know, you need to add something, being very strategic in um, your decision as to what to add um, and thinking about those additions as occurring in small steps, you know, not just you know, adopting a whole new um, curriculum, you know, that's going to be presented by your um, counselors for character development, you know, but thinking about small steps that you could take. Um, and it's also important that you are careful to not let discussions um, stop with barriers. Okay, for example, you know, we can, we can, you know, begin these discussions and then we can get stuck on the fact that, you know, we don't have the resources, you know, we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we don't have the staff to do these additional things. So just being careful to, to shift to that focus if it, it seems to be moving in that direction. Um, you know, we really want to focus on uh, what we have, what efforts we have made, perhaps over the past year or a couple of years. Um, we want to look at what skill sets that um, our faculty and staff already possess. Um, and, you know, think about the trainings that we've completed already and how we might use that information that we've learned to help us grow. Um, I really like to um, be sure that um, schools reflect on how far that they have come. And with regard, in this case, with regard to behavior and social emotional supports, um, I like to use West Virginia, you know, as an example, um, our uh, Department of Education has, um, you know, really spent some time on an initiative referred to as Reclaim West Virginia. And on our website, um, if you go to the Reclaim West Virginia tab, um, you would get access to lots and lots of materials, trainings, resources for um, improving behavior and social emotional development, um, trauma sensitive practices. Um, West Virginia Department of Ed has also collaborated with a group at Marshall and created the Behavior, Behavioral Mental Health Technical Assistance Center. So that's another great resource um, to access and it shows how um, you know, we have recognized the needs in our communities and in our staff, you know, in our schools, and we've moved forward to put some um, things together to, um, you know, to support our, our children and families. And then again, you know, what Ladada had talked to us about at the very beginning, um, the REL Appalachia resources, you know, it's another um, place to go. And, and it's important to recognize all the efforts that have been made to put um, those materials together as well. So um, along, you know, along with our, our thinking about what we have, listing what we have and how far we've come, um, I want you to pause for just a minute and think about your own school. So personalize this a little bit. Um, think about what initiatives and efforts are happening in your own schools and how can you integrate and align those initiative and efforts? Um, 
if you have some ideas or if you have some really good things in place already, you know, reflect on that and pat yourself on the back. Um, if there um, are some things you would like to see happen, um, be jotting down some notes about, you know, what steps that you might take in order to move things in the right direction. Um, so just a couple of examples of, um, you know, teams that may exist in your schools and some resources that you may already possess. Um, and, and these were discussed by um, Michelle and Mariana both, but just um, we'll revisit them. So think about those teams that you have, um, perhaps positive behavior intervention and support team, um, our, our MTSS um, team that addresses behavior. How can you connect those two? Um, using your um, school employed mental health providers, such as your school psychologists, your school counselors, your school social workers, um, how are those folks able to collaborate with teachers and, and staff and how are, and you know, what is their time that they have um, for planning, you know, activities that could impact um, larger groups of kids. Um, if you are fortunate to have some community partners that provide school based mental health providers, think about the communication systems that are in place. Um, if a child is receiving services from one of those providers. Um, is that provider able to talk with school staff about, you know, how well that child is doing or perhaps some challenges, um, some things that, that might be helpful in the school? And then, you know, just thinking about overall your um, social emotional learning programs and activities. Um, are there some activities that are, that are embedded in your um, core content areas? You know, are there some things that, you know, language arts teachers are doing or math teachers are doing um, to promote social emotional development? All right, so <clears throat> we've talked about listing and leveraging what we already have or what you already have in place. Um, so secondly, you know, once you have your list, Start thinking about what overlaps do you um, do you find, and then also what gaps might you have. Um, for example, you might have um, a really good system in place for um, you know students who are at that tier three level. You know those students who are needing that one to one counseling. You might have a great system set up, but you might find that um, you know your middle level, your tier two level is not, um, you know, there's, there's not as much supports available there for students who are considered at risk. And if you strengthened that mid-level, you might not have as many students who are um, needing those intensive supports. Um, so, you know, making a list of supports, um, we talked about maybe visualizing that in terms of the pyramid. Um, and then I'm going to share with you um, some guidance specifically from the um, trauma sensitive guide that that we have referenced. Um, so a couple things to think about um, when you are um, considering your next steps. It's really important that you establish a time frame um, that you schedule and assign tasks that need to be completed you know, to individuals, perhaps. Um, oftentimes we need to have some accountability. So if we have someone in charge um, who is saying, okay, when this step is completed, you know, let me know. Or someone saying, okay, I know I'm in charge of step two. And if step two is not completed, then you know, step three can't be completed. So those sorts of things. Um, one page number in the um, guide that we're referring to, page 53, um, might want to jot that down um, because that begins the um, structured overview or that it, it provides you with a template um, for how to organize your thinking in this process. And I'm going to share that structure with you on um, a later slide. Okay, so um, what the um, template um, has for you to do uh, begins with some um, key, um, there's some key things that I, that I wanted to preview with you a little bit to help prepare you for what you would need in order to, to start that process. And so um, those things are listed in 
bold here on this um, slide. So, you know, you need to be thinking about, first of all, what are your goals? You know, what is your key objective or your key objectives um, in establishing a trauma sensitive school? Um, secondly, you know, really being explicit with the action steps that you need to take. Um, for example, you might have um, some action steps that you think are really not all that important, like making phone calls or scheduling meetings, but you know, those are very important steps that you need to um, bear in mind. Um, also thinking about structured communication systems, like I had mentioned, you know, do you have community providers working in your schools, um, but perhaps there's not an informed consent in place for them to be able to talk with um, teachers and, and staff about students. Um, so not only do you establish your action steps, but you need to establish the time frame. Okay, remember we had talked about that, um, you know, setting a, a date for when step one is gonna be completed, step two is gonna be completed and actually making a note of that. Um, and then assigning um, responsible parties for these action steps. And that is, you know, being as detailed as actually writing down the person's name. Um, and this is, again, to help with that um, accountability. And, you know, we know that we need accountability. We need leaders to make sure that things get accomplished. Um, you know, we've talked about resources. So actually making a list of resources that you have and that could help you um, achieve these goals that you are working towards. Um, resources might be you know, time, money, staff, um, but you might find that it's a matter of just adjusting schedules, things that you already have in place and so you're not having to spend money or you're not having to hire more people, but you've got to build in some, some time for collaboration to take place. And then lastly, but certainly not um, of least importance, is um, determining how you're going to measure success and what are some benchmarks um, that you are going to be um, checking in on. Um, how are you going to know if you are moving in the right direction or not? Um, Mariana talked about um, setting some realistic um, goals and being sure to acknowledge those small steps that you're taking. And so I think that that applies very much to um, this planning process. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at our, our pyramid. And, um, you know, this, this pyramid, I think many of us are familiar with when it comes to academic supports in schools for our students. You know, what are we providing for all students at tier one, then our at risk students for tier two, and then our students who are um, in most need and have not responded to tiers one and two, you know, what are we giving them at tier three. So what this particular um, slide does is it takes that framework and says, here is how we are thinking about it in terms of supporting students who have been trauma exposed. And um, in fact, you know, here are some things that would support all students' behavior and social emotional development. Um, so, you know, when I was talking with you about your planning process, you know, you might want to take tier one and list out some of those things that are in place at your school, same for tier two and same for tier three. So just as Mar Mariana had illustrated, um, this process for supports for your staff. Um, you could do the same thing for supports for your students. Um, now on the next slide, this is gonna begin our, our activity um, with hypothetical school A. And so this is the activity that you could um, do with your own um, staff and faculty in, in your schools. Um, so it takes the template that's provided in the action guide and you know, we start with the first column, which is what are those supports? So in this case, you know, what are those tier one supports that you have in your school? And so some possibilities, you know, here are some things that you might have. Um, a way for teaching behavior expectations to all students. You might have as part of your day, you know, mindfulness or self-regulation activities. Um, you may already have social emotional learning goals embedded into activities in those content areas. Um, another tier one support is you may have a check-in system such as a morning meeting um, that you know, your teachers do with kids, you know, just 
let's get our day started, you know, and let's, you know, think about what we need to do, you know, um, during the day. And, and that's also a time for teachers to kind of assess if there are kids who are coming in with some um, negativity, you know, maybe they're seeing some, um, some affect, you know, that's of concern, maybe um, the kids are actually talking with them about some things that happened you know, last night. Maybe they're seeing a child who just looks really tired. Um, so, you know, that just gives the opportunity for that teacher to, to make a mental note and, you know, perhaps communicate that concern to other teachers who will have that student um, the rest of the day. So these are examples of some tier one supports. And you can see that the next column is where you would put uh, the responsible parties. So who in your building is responsible for each of these supports? And I've listed some examples and I, and I didn't name you know, individuals because this is our hypothetical school, but when you're doing this activity, you may in fact want to list the names of people who fulfill these roles. Um, then our next column, we have um, a communication system. And so in the cells, I have yes or no. So what you could do in this activity, is you could say to yourself, well, you know, for example, if, if I have a child who the teacher um, during the morning, you know, realizes that there are some, some, some problems, um, how can I inform the teachers later on in the day? You know, do I have a system of communication in place? Um, if, for example, um, I'm having a student who is, you know, particularly, um, you know, challenged, you know, this morning during um, our mindfulness activity, or a child who's coming in from, you know, recess and is having trouble getting settled down, how can I get that message communicated to others who will be um, um, with that student later on? Um, and then the last column is the data sources, and I have left that blank, um, but thinking about how are you collecting data um, to determine if these supports are effective or not? And how are you um, using your data to determine if a child might need to be, you know, given some additional supports, such as a tier two support? So, um, you just take a moment and reflect on that. You might even want to, um, you know, take this chart and begin kind of filling it in and, you know, thinking about your own school. Okay, now we'll move on to um, tier two. So tier two, we have the same um, structure here. We have our supports, our responsible parties, our communication system, and our data sources. Um, so again, you know, you could put a chart like this out and then, you know, work with your staff and faculty about um, listing those supports, filling in those cells, who are the responsible parties, the communication system, um, and then some data sources. So our tier two supports, some examples that you might have um, would be, you know, small group activities that um, are led by your counselors or your school psychologists, your school social workers. Um, these small groups might be comprised of kids who are, um, you know, having similar um, challenges with, you know, conflict resolution, or there's some, um, you know, family or life circumstance that they are all facing. And so having that um, small group who is dealing with the same sorts of things, you know, and discussing and processing how to cope with those, um, you know, would be good. Um, a check-in, check-out system is another um, tier two support. And so this is one that's more um, individualized, more specific than just the morning meeting that we were talking about as a tier one support. Um, so with a tier two support, uh, you may have, you know, one or two children assigned to a specific um, adult in the building. And that person, you know, really, you know, meets with them and says, hey, hey, Steve, how, you know, how was last night? Um, and they know some things about the student. And so they could even say, you know, um, Steve, I know you were going to go visit your dad last night. How'd that go? Um, and so, you know, again, that would be, um, you know, a, an example of tier two support. And, and it's important to think about those, um, those adults who can do those check-ins, not only as your teachers, but just other staff in your building. Um, you know, think about 
you know, your school secretary, think about your um, custodians, think about coaches, um, think about um, folks who are working in the cafeteria, um, think about our bus drivers. You know, there are lots of adults that um, connect with kids. So, you know, utilizing those people who are available um, and who may have you know, strong relationships with kids is important. Um, so again, you know, I want you to pause, you know, reflect on, you know, what this chart would look like in your school um, and also be thinking about how you might present this to your staff and faculty um, as, a, as something for them to be thinking about and helping you fill in those blank cells. All right, so now we'll end with tier three supports. And so as you can see, the charts, you know, the very same as tier one and tier two, um, we're looking at, you know, what are the supports, who is responsible, um, what's the communication system and how are we collecting data? What data are we collecting and how are we using that data? Um, one thing I did not mention on tier two, but that is um, also a tier three support, um, and that's screening and progress monitoring. So what system do we have in place that um, is allowing us to see how children are, um, you know, responding to, um, you know, interventions or, you know, just how are our students overall um, handling um, emotions such as anger? Um, you know, are we, are we using any norm referenced uh, measures? Are we um, taking a look at how our kids are compared to national norms or local norms or you know, just classroom norms? Um, you know, what system do we have? So you know, it's important to, to be thinking about that. Um, and if you don't have a system, that might be a first step for you um, to take. Um, it's something else I wanted to mention about tier three. Um, you know, you may have some community providers who are working in your schools, providing individual counseling, group counseling. Um, and I've said this a couple of times, but thinking about the communication that's permitted between those providers and your um, school staff, um, you know, are they able to share information about um, students who are, you know, doing quite well and, and, and making some progress? Um, and are they able to consult? with your um, you know, folks in the building about some suggestions that could help this child you know, make even more progress. Um, and then again, you know, we wanna be cautious about um, having students who are missed. You know, we may have students who have um, services from both the school and they're getting some individual services from community providers, but then we may have this um, you know, group of kids who are not receiving any services. So we want to be sure that our system um, addresses all kids, you know, and that we are keeping our eyes on all kids. So again, take some time um, to reflect on your school and also think about how you might, um, you know, uh, do this activity with your staff. Okay, so phase four, we are wrapping things up. Um, phase four um, involves recognizing what um, are some positive things that are in place and how can we sustain those positive things. Um, so phase four asks you to be thinking about these six main questions. And so these questions are really asking you to take a, a critical look at some processes that you have in place and in your school, think about what's working, what's not, thinking about what you have, what's missing, um, thinking about what you've learned and how you might be able to um, improve upon you know, some good things or how can you address some things that are not at, are, are not functioning you know, exactly how you would want them to be. Um, and I, I do wanna make a, uh, a comment about, um, about middle of the way down one of the questions, how do we keep what's working? Um, I think about this question when I think about um, schools who perhaps have received some grant money 
and they're able to either employ some additional uh, mental health staff or um, you know they're able to do some things with their schedules um, but when that grant money is gone you know they might not be able to sustain what was in place so i think you know doing some planning and some thinking about what is working you know with that um, grant funding you know what's working and how can you keep that when the money is no longer there that's important to to do you know well before um, the grant ends And last uh, for me, just concluding with um, some steps about sustaining trauma sensitivity that are listed in your guide. Um, and this is a review. We've talked a lot about um, these things already. Um, maintaining those trauma sensitive work groups. Um, you know, when you have some good things going, you know, keeping those um, things going, and that might might require you to do some scheduling um, to allow time for those meetings to happen. Um, evaluating implementation and impact. You know, Mariana touched on this, and I've talked about this a little bit, but you want to be able to measure the impact that your um, supports are, are having on your students. Um, you know, one example would be to take a look at office discipline referrals, you know, look at your attendance data. Um, you, you may even want to just chat with teachers and, and teachers could say things to you like, you know what, I'm noticing more smiles in my classroom. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing more happy faces and I'm hearing more laughter. Um, but just making sure that you are paying attention to um, the movement um, that's happening as a result of these interventions. Um, definitely being prepared to respond to changing needs. Um, you know, one example I've talked about um, you know, with, with group, other groups that I've worked with is, you know, the needs of our students in February 2020 versus the needs of our students currently in March of 2021. You know, we had, you know, so much has happened over the course of a year. Um, and we have had to you know, really pull together and make sure that we are meeting those current needs of our students. Um, making sure that you're reviewing your plans and that you're updating um, your plans. Um, going back to those action steps and saying, you know, were these taken? What was the result? Building communities of practice, networking and connecting with other schools, other districts, other states. Um, who have some um, trauma sensitive um, initiatives, learning from them. Um, and then lastly, when you are learning something and something good is going on, educate others and you know, share your knowledge, um, as well as taking that knowledge that you that you can from, from other folks. So um, you know, that wraps up our phases three and four, and I want to turn it back over to Ladada. Thank you, Condra. And I hope that everyone has enjoyed um, hearing this information. I think it's, it's very helpful information and I hope that it has been meaningful to you. I would like to just take a few minutes to ask you to reflect on the day. And, you know, as we think about um, just all of the things that you've heard and how it can impact your school, your students, your parents, families, uh, educators, you know, there, there are just so many different aspects to this and, and so many opportunities for reflection and consideration of, you know, what, what is next and how you can apply the things that you've heard about today. So I'd like to start with asking you, what is something we discussed that squared with your experience? Um, and I, I would encourage you to pause the recording take a few minutes to think about that and just really think about what things, you know, square with your experience and perhaps, you know, uh, things that you could start to change based on what you've learned. Then as you come back, uh, I would like to ask you, what are three points that you want to remember? And again, please pause and take the time while this is fresh in your mind to respond and answer these questions so that you have those to refer to. Last, the question is, what is lingering? What is a lingering question still going around in your mind? And again, encourage you to pause 
the recording and consider your response to that question. So now that you have answered those questions, um, just like to summarize by you know reminding you that this session today, this webinar was part of a three-part series. Module one was the um, webinar that focused on the impacts and symptoms of trauma and relevant strategies to support students. The second was more focused on classroom and school practices to support students experiencing trauma. Both of those recordings are available on the REL Appalachia website, um, as well as this one, uh, School Systems Policies and Procedures to Support Students Experiencing Trauma. You can also share um, this with your colleagues. Again, it's on, <clears throat> as you know, the REL Appalachia website and the West Virginia Department of Education LMS platform. There are also office hours that we held um, in depending upon when you're listening to this, you know, you may be able to join us for those drop-in virtual hours. You can also receive a certificate of completion for this work and um, or for listening to this webinar and for, you know, being involved in this work and thinking about how you can apply the things you've learned back in your schools. On our website, you will find my email address. All you have to do is to email me, ladata at elevation.com, and I will make sure that you receive a certificate of completion after you have watched this recording and, and listened to this webinar. There is a certificate of completion available. If you were listening to this live, um, we always ask our participants to complete a stakeholder feedback survey. Um, it is very important to us that we receive feedback from our audience to know, you know, what resonated with them, what was most helpful, do they have recommendations or suggestions for change and, and additional things that we might be able to do. Um, so that's very important to us as part of the Institute of Education Sciences, as part of the regional education laboratories across the country. It's very important to us that we hear your feedback, that we receive your feedback and then use it to improve um, the things that we are doing in the future. Just a reminder, the cert certificate, if you're interested, is available. And I would like to thank you for participating today, um, for taking your time to listen to this webinar. You'll see contact information um, on the next slide. If, um, if you'd like more information or if you'd like to reach out to us about something um, related to this webinar or other questions that you have related to the regional education labs. Again, appreciate you joining us. Remember to email me if you are interested in a certificate and we do appreciate your time and wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you.